This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through the business news stories you need to know about from the continent and beyond. But first, a run through the markets. NASPERS is our starting focus. The shares fell hard in today's session at the JSE, down by over 5%. Now, to be clear, there's still over 14% high so far in the year, but the decline today is directly linked to a sentiment change linked to one of its biggest assets, Tencent. The tech firm is facing much tighter oversight, especially on its financial products in its biggest market of China. Tencent shares are actually down by over 4% in trading in Hong Kong today. The top 40 at the JSE ending this week about a third of a percent lower. The main index in Nigeria is nearly 200 basis points lower at the close on Friday. Here's what's coming up tonight. Ghana rolls out an ambitious plan to plug its fiscal deficit, which had gone up to 13% of GDP. S&P and Fitch downgrade Ethiopia's credit rating. But what does this imply? And the European Central Bank will accelerate bond buying to stabilise a block after the pandemic's economic damage. Let's start in West Africa, Ghana to be specific. The country plans to raise at least $888 million from new taxes this year to cut its deficit and to help smaller businesses weather the fallout from the coronavirus pandemic. The government over there is looking to raise the cash using digital platforms to make collections a lot more efficient in order to expand the tax base. Another $174 million will come in from an increase in consumption taxes by any between 100 and 200 basis points and by raising taxes on petroleum and there's a new tax that will come in on bank profits too. Some of the new funds will be used to support SMEs. Africa's largest coal producer is also looking to reduce the fiscal gap, estimated to have reached a 13-year high in 2020 at 11.5%, or rather 11.4% rather, of GDP. The government is targeting a budget deficit of about 9% to 10% this year. All right, then let's explore the details of this particular budget in detail. Nabil Ahmed Rufai joins us from Accra with more data on Ghana's 2021 spending plan. Um, Nabil, walk us through the reactions you're getting to the proposed spending plan as presented in Parliament today. Well, Rama, the budget as presented today uh, was themed consolidation, uh, was themed completion, uh, consolidation, and continuity. Uh, what that means is that a lot of the things that was presented had to do with the fact that in terms of completion, the government was going to complete a lot of projects that started last year but was disrupted because of the coronavirus pandemic and uh, the shortfall in revenue generation. Uh, so the government says this year is going to complete a lot of the road projects that it initiated last year. Also, some educational infrastructure and healthcare infrastructure are going to, com to be completed this year. Also, they are looking at consolidating some of the policies that they started during the first tenure of their office, that from 2017 to 2020, uh, these policies are going to be really implemented. And then some of the projects are also going to be continued this year. Uh, then uh, some of the reactions from these uh, statements that was presented today had to do with the fact that uh, the minority were not happy that the government was going to introduce new taxes uh, this year. Uh, the minority feel that um, the coronavirus pandemic, the shocks are still being experienced by a large population. And the fact that uh, new taxes have been introduced, a lot of people are going to be burdened. And they are also saying that uh, they feel the government could have um, handled the situation better. The government on its uh, uh, defense said um, once um, uh, the, the shocks caused by pandemic was really felt last year, they were not able to implement a lot of projects. And this year, that's their target. So the only way they can do that is to introduce uh, new taxes so they can generate a lot of revenue to embark on such projects. But then uh, the minority uh, are not happy about the way the government is going to go about things. Right. Now, the government also uh, is targeting uh, a GDP growth rate of... Um, 5% this year, uh, which is contrary to the 1.4% that the, w, uh, the World Bank has projected. And the minority are also saying that that's a far 
uh, a big target for the government to achieve, considering the fact that Ghana's uh, debt rate is standing at 76% of GDP, and they would want the government to do something to reduce uh, the debt stock. Let's, let's talk about that debt side of, of the equation as well, because the, the spending plan also uh, essentially implies the country has to borrow around $5 billion in the course of this year. Does the finance ministry have an explicit upper limit uh, for interest rates above which it will simply not take any foreign debt? Well, Rama, for now, the uh, Minister of Finance has not clearly stated the interest rates above which it will not uh, go for debt. But what we know is that the budget statement that was presented uh, today had um, outlined some strategies that the government would be undertaking to manage its debt. And one has to do with uh, domestically is looking at um, issuing bonds uh, between medium to long term and also is looking at using its treasury bills to serve as cash buffer. For now, that's what we know. But then as to whether the government has a cut of points within which uh, interest rate, it will not go for loans, is not explicitly said that as yet, Rama. One last question for you now, Bill. In this $5 billion amount that he wants to borrow in the international market, do we know what the allocation of that is? How much will be raised through euro bonds? How much will be raised through syndicated loans and so on? Well, uh, Rama, last year the government was targeting $3 billion and it actually said it was going to raise that through euro bonds. But this year when the budget was read, we are understanding that it's targeting $5 billion and it's saying that it's because it feels there are other avenues that it could raise this, uh, I mean, $5 billion and that has to do with the syndicated loans as well. But we don't know for now as to how much uh, that one would take. But uh, we know that the budget uh, has been read today and then next week, Tuesday, a debate on the budget is going to start. And that's where uh, minority in parliament or even the majority will probe further as to the details of this particular uh, 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 bonds that the government is seeking to really acquire, $5 billion. We need to know the details. And the, deb the debate, which will start next week, will offer more answers to this, uh, Rama. Nabil Ahmed Rufai in Accra, Ghana. Thank you. Now, on to the other end of the continent. South African mining data released by Stats SA for January was disappointing for some analysts. Total mining output declined by over 6% year on year following a contraction of 1.8% in December last year. Here's CGTN's Angela Coppola for this analysis. December and January mining production is volatile generally. Despite this, production isn't recovering as quickly as expected. Basically, diamonds, other minerals, and manganese that's doing slightly better. The rest are all still down. So there's certainly a, a production uh, adjustments that are taking place. And, and I cannot help but repeat that we, we know that about 50,000 of the workforce is not back because of the, the, the risk factor and the adjustment to new procedures, new operational uh, procedures and the logistics. There are major concerns about the logistics when moving the country's commodities to ports of departure for export markets. I was in a meeting about coal. 10 million tons of coal can't get to the, to the harbour because of rail problems. And chrome isn't much better. So, so the logistics re-engaging operations are actually taking time. South Africa's mining sector remains a significant contributor to the country's economy. And being in the order of 7 8% of GDP, so whatever happens with, with mining this year, you have to multiply by 0 0.8 to, to understand what the impact is. So if we grow slightly, um, then, then it would be not much, but it, it, it would contribute to actually stabilize the, the, the overall value. While there might be some debate about whether the South African mining sector is a sunrise or a sunset industry, there's no question that it's making a massive contribution to the country's GDP, especially in these times of COVID. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. The Ethiopian government and Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, uh, PJSC Mastar, have signed a memorandum of understanding in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa. That agreement will enable investment 
from the UAE for the production of at least, for the investment rather, into a 500 megawatt solar power plant in Ethiopia. The signing of the MOU was initiated during a state visit by the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed in the United Arab Emirates in early 2020. The primary objective of this deal is to formalize the intentions of both parties to further discuss potential areas of collaboration in green energy, and that covers potential projects and related services. The potential is there, but the realization of those potential uh, is requiring to have a um, trusted partner like uh, you guys. So today's um, MOE with uh, Abu Dhabi, future energy company, uh, Masdar, is a demonstration of enhancing public-private partnership. Ethiopia looks forward to the fruits of uh, such partnership. In any economy around the world, from Washington, D.C. to Beijing, that the top priority for all of these countries is climate change. Climate change and renewable energy. So as a company focused on renewable energy, solar and wind, and when we look at Ethiopia, we see abundant resources, abundant resources for solar and wind, and, and we are really happy to be here. Let's start in the world of pharmaceuticals for this company, News Wrap. GlaxoSmithKline has said that London-based Hikma Pharmaceuticals has dropped plans to acquire GSK Egypt. Hikma planned to buy GSK's 91.2% stake in Egypt's operations. Hikma supplies generic drugs, including anesthetics, pain medications, sedatives, neuromuscular blocking agents, and anti-infectives. Back in January, it said it was planning to buy GSK assets. British American Tobacco has announced plans to buy a near 20% stake in the Canada-based cannabis producer Organigram for about $176 million, even as the company looks to diversify beyond its main tobacco business. As part of the agreement, a center of excellence will be established to focus on developing the next generation of cannabis products with initial focus on CBD, or cannabinoids, if you will. The deal makes BAT the largest single shareholder in Organigram. In East Africa, Kenyans bought more mobile phones in the three months from October to December 2020 than they did in July to September of the same year. According to IDC, the demand for mobile phones in Kenya increased by 15% in the fourth quarter of 2020 compared to the quarter before. The hike in sales was linked to aggressive marketing campaigns as well. Now, despite the increase in quarter and quarter mobile phone sales, sales at the end of the year were 2% lower than total sales at the end of 2019. And finally, the British luxury group Burberry said it would beat market forecasts for profits and revenues in its final quarter after a strong rebound in sales since December, sending its shares to pre-pandemic levels. In an unscheduled trading update, Burberry said that comparable store retail sales in the last quarter of its financial year to March 27th were expected to be about 28 to 32 percent higher compared to the same period a year earlier. Shares in the firm jumped by as much as 10% in early deals, rather early trading to the highest level since the 22nd of January 2020. That's a run through your company headlines. You're watching Global Business Africa. Plenty more content coming up, including this. How about S&P and Fitch have both downgraded Ethiopia's credit rating? What happens next? And Africa's largest economy has reported a $19 billion trade deficit. The data is coming up shortly. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast sharp and insightful global business only on cgtn there's more to this place than just glorious landscapes there's more to it than just say table mountain or glorious endless salt flats there's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world there is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home 
and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back. International ratings agencies have downgraded Ethiopia's long-term foreign and local currency sovereign credit ratings. Both S&P and Fitch say that the country's debt burden has been worsened by the pandemic. Now, obviously, the coronavirus pandemic has wreaked havoc on Ethiopia's tourism sector. It's devastated businesses dependent on that sector completely, as Kolesha Njohi now explains. According to rating agency S&P, Ethiopia's public debt stands at about $5.5 billion for the period between 2021 to 2024. Some economists say a downgrade of international credit worthiness by the agencies should not be a cause for worry. If your creditors, if your private credits outstanding are relatively small compared to your bilateral, I mean, that's the case with Ethiopia. It's mostly bilateral. It's mostly with DFIs. Uh, it's very little, relatively speaking, compared to the outstanding amount what Ethiopia owes to private credit. As I said, there's only one euro bond for a billion dollars. In fact, from what I've seen, the latest number I've seen, this, this year, the interest payment is only $66 million. Okay? So if that's the profile you're in, and you are not looking to issue in the near future euro bonds or tap into the global private credit market, don't worry about the short-term hit your credit rating. Fitch Ratings highlights debts from Ethiopian state-owned enterprises to private creditors. Two of them, the national carrier Ethiopian Airlines and telecom company Ethio Telecom, reportedly have an outstanding debt of about $3.3 billion. The Ethiopian government says at the core of its economic reforms is to see that all state-owned enterprises meet payments. From the balance sheet of the Commercial Bank of Ethiopia, it's not erased. So there will be some restructuring of the remaining debt, which state-owned enterprise has to, has to continue honoring. But it will not come to the budget as well. It will finance it through non-budgetary means. The main source of which we are expecting soon is uh, from privatization pro proceeds, as well as is uh, also dividend from uh, state-owned enterprise as well. Ethiopia has applied for debt relief under the G20 program for poor countries. In its defense, Ethiopia says it needs to redirect its resources towards the immunization of its population against COVID-19. The country of over 100 million people will receive about 8 million doses under the COVAX facility supported by the WHO. However, it will need to purchase more vaccines in order to meet the needs of more of its citizens. Other African countries like Chad are seeking relief too. Zemedene Negatu says African countries should focus more on growth than debt. So I would tell African government, don't be overly concerned. In fact, take advantage of this unique opportunity that you've been given to reprofile your debt, to restructure, and hopefully to cancel a certain amount of your debt. A year or two, you, are, you look pretty to these investors because now they know you've, you've offloaded a lot of your debt. You're in a position to repay them even with the 7, 8, or 10% yield that they're looking for. So don't be too concerned. Proceed what's in your best interest. Rating agencies say there are other risks to Ethiopia's debt profile and credit worthiness, including the ongoing conflict in the country's north and tension over upcoming elections. Koleto Anjohi, CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. More stories based around macro data, this time from Nigeria. The, East, the West African oil producer recorded a trade deficit of about $19 billion in 2020. That's the first time that Africa's largest economy has reported a, tra a negative trade deficit since 2016. It's essentially a 317% decline compared to the trade surplus of $6 billion recorded in 2019. Here's Deji Badmus with more from Lagos. To many close watchers of the Nigerian economy, the trade figures released by the Nigeria Bureau of Statistics are not really a surprise. The figures show how badly the Nigerian economy has been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Not surprising, the statistics show that while the country's import in 2020 increased by 17.3 percent, exports fell 34.8 percent. At the very heart of the decline 
is the country's economic lifeblood, crude oil. The export of the commodity dropped by 35.7 percent. If you look at the structure of our exports uh, and export earnings, oil still accounts for close to 95 percent of our export earnings. And because in 2020 we had a crash in oil price, we also had a, almost a crash also in oil output because of OPEC calls, the pandemic and all of that. So once we had that challenge with the exports of crude oil, our uh, trade, our balance of trade automatically crashed. Nigeria's local currency has come under severe pressure lately. With the country's reserve depleting, the central bank has had to carry out at least two rounds of devaluation to stabilize the local currency. Analysts say the country's negative trade balance is partly to blame. We are seeing an expansion in consumption of foreign goods in terms of manufactured goods, in terms of uh, raw materials, in terms of uh, a production of oil products, where we're not seeing a commensurate increase in the value of the products we're exporting. Uh, it's impacting on our foreign reserve, and the further impact of that is that you're going to see pressure in foreign exchange, exchange which is why we're seeing Naira depreciate further. Economic experts say the statistics is also a clear wake-up call for managers of the economy to redouble efforts at propping up the non-oil sector in order to address the huge trade deficit. The, the terms of trade is also not favorable because of the quality of our exports. The bulk of our non-oil exports are primary products. And because they are not processed, they have very little value addition. They don't command very good price. And that goes to further weaken the value of our exports. So the weaker the, the export value, the less favorable is the balance of trade. Nigeria has a lot of work to do to address its trade deficit. Many say the key to fixing the problem is local manufacturing and getting people to buy made in Nigeria. The government says it is building the needed infrastructure to make that happen, but it's quick to add that the process will take time. Digibatmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. The coronavirus pandemic has been a pretty unprecedented period in recent history. The report of many lives lost, economies ravaged, and a state of collective pressure. And that's resulted on many nations being very keen to get a vaccine that can slow down the spread of this disease. And it seems that's happening at any cost. While well, several vaccines have started production last year, when it comes to distribution and availability to poorer nations, a new challenge is threatening to derail the collective fight against COVID-19. CGTN's Lindim Tongana takes a look at the rise of vaccine nationalism and Africa's position in this scramble for the few available doses. For over a year now, Africa's healthcare systems have been stretched thin by the coronavirus pandemic. Over 100,000 people across the continent have succumbed to the disease, many of them doctors and nurses. With a second wave now spreading through parts of Africa, experts agree the only way to firmly end this pandemic is through widespread vaccination campaigns. Unfortunately, the majority of Africans may wait up to two years to receive their doses. In this episode of Panorama Africa, we take a look at unequal access to vaccines and life-saving medicines in Africa. It's another busy morning at the Hiwatele oxygen plant here in Nairobi. Since 2014, this social enterprise has been quietly supplying oxygen to patients in public and private health facilities across Kenya. But it wasn't until the coronavirus pandemic that the country's health sector really paid attention to what happens here. The most memorable time was around October, November last year, 2020. That's when the mortality was quite high. We had hospitals coming to this plant and basically fighting for oxygen. Hiwatele had to boost production dramatically. We had to hire more people so that we could produce 24-7. Uh, we had to expand our distribution infrastructure by leasing more trucks 
and uh, importing more canisters, the cylinders, to allow us to meet um, the demand of the market. Uh, basically, if we compare our pre-COVID and at the height of COVID, the demand doubled. Though Kenya may have been spared the worst of the pandemic, Dr. Olayo and other experts are hoping vaccines will help ease the pressure on the country's healthcare system. Kenya has already received its first batch of just over 1 million AstraZeneca vaccines. A total of 24 million doses will be administered across the country in a three-phase rollout. The first phase has already begun, targeting health workers, teachers and those in the security sector. Most Kenyans could be vaccinated by 2022, but the timelines are much worse in other parts of Africa, with full rollout expected to be completed by late 2023, if at all. So why isn't Africa receiving the vaccines it needs? Let's take a look at how vaccines get to Africa. Most low-income countries will rely on COVAX, the WHO initiative aimed at securing 6 billion doses of vaccines for poorer countries. COVAX will only cover 20% of the population of each country. The first 2 billion doses will be administered in 2021, primarily to healthcare workers. The challenge is COVAX must first procure these vaccines, and this is getting harder as richer nations race ahead of poorer ones buying up crucial supplies. Canada has pre-ordered enough vaccines to inoculate its population five times over. The UK and the US have bought enough vaccines for four per person, while the EU and Australia will have two each. Consequently, the African Union has entered into bilateral agreements directly with vaccine manufacturers successfully procuring 270 million doses of vaccines for the continent. But it's hardly enough for Africa's 1.3 billion people. Furthermore, these agreements tend to be more expensive. South Africa paid two and a half times more than European countries for the AstraZeneca vaccine. To make matters worse, these orders have been complicated by export controls introduced by the European Union this mechanism gives countries the power to deny authorization for vaccine exports if existing contracts within the EU have not been met. An alternative, as advocated by South Africa and India, is to push the World Trade Organization to allow for any patents related to COVID-19 vaccines to be waived. This means that anyone, anywhere, would be allowed to manufacture the vaccines quickly and cheaply. It's in, in, in essence a very, very fair and very reasonable demand to say, listen, uh, during the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic, we all need to be able to manufacture what can help us get out of the pandemic. The proposal has received the support of the African Union, but has met stiff opposition from some of the world's wealthiest countries, including the European Union, the United States and Switzerland, all of whom are home to major pharmaceutical companies. It goes against the language, of course, of equitable vaccine distribution. So we can, of course, only speculate as to why they, they don't want to support the waiver. But the consequence, in essence, is that they don't want to share. Uh, and, and that's perhaps the reason they don't want to share uh, the ability and technology to manufacture vaccines. It's a sad situation for the global health community because you'd imagine that this would be the only time when people's lives would matter more than profits. Even Kenya, Kenya as a country has capacity to reconstitute and develop these vaccines if, if that patent was waived. We can do it quickly and that would be the best way, you know, produce and deploy quickly within the country. Sadly, it's not the first time that Africa finds itself facing unequal access to life-saving medical treatments. In 1998, 39 international pharmaceutical companies sued the South African government over its attempt to buy cheap HIV medicines from India, rather than expensive antiretroviral drugs from the United States. Though the case was eventually dropped due to public pressure, the damage had already been done. Delays in procuring affordable ARVs resulted in many unnecessary deaths. During a time of pandemic, 
uh, it cannot be left to the market forces, to the monopolies of a few pharmaceutical manufacturers, manufacturers sorry, to determine the availability and secondly, the price in this case of vaccines and in the past of, of ARVs. If we are reliant on the rest of the world, wherever that is to supply our vaccines, Africa is gonna be uh, last in line again. And that is what we're seeing now with, with regards to COVID-19 vaccines. The pandemic has exposed and exploited the inequalities of our world. There is now real danger that the very tools that could help to end the pandemic, vaccines, may exacerbate those same inequalities. Vaccine nationalism might serve short-term political goals, but it's ultimately short-sighted and self-defeating. We will not end the pandemic anywhere until we end it everywhere. Vaccine nationalism happens when governments sign deals with drug manufacturers, especially the ones in their own countries, to exclusively supply the necessary medicines to their own populations, as is the case with COVID-19 vaccines. The world has also witnessed cases where governments push their companies to be granted exclusive rights to supply medicines during disease outbreaks, like the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The Democratic Republic of Congo has also been a theater of similar events, as the Ebola outbreak continues taking grim twists and turns. Companies from Asia, America and Europe competed to supply their vaccines to the Great Lakes nation. In the race for a COVID-19 vaccine, some African governments and private researchers were part of the groundbreaking medical achievements recorded, but it seems Africans were less appreciated as the bragging rights ended up in Western capitals. For example, phase three trials of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine were conducted on South African citizens in October 2020. In November, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine was tried on 400 volunteer Kenyan health workers. But when it comes to the acquisition and procurement of these drugs, it seems Africa is left playing second fiddle. According to me, try it first on animals. See how it reacts, then and if it is okay, we will accept it. My work has been affected, but if it is possible for everyone to be vaccinated, people will be free with life, freedom of movement, freedom to do their activities without the corona restrictions. That is my hope. I'm eagerly waiting for the vaccine. I'll not get vaccinated and I'll not allow my family to do it. What if it has side effects? They could be revealed after many years. I don't trust new commercial vaccines. I'm very scared, so I don't think I'll take it now due to what I'm hearing from people. I'll take it because there's no problem taking it and to protect myself and protect others. Dr. Olayo believes more needs to be done to address skepticism and misinformation. So it's our responsibility as a public health community to educate the public and to explain to them the merits of vaccination. There are so many vaccines coming in. How different is the AstraZeneca from Pfizer and from Johnson and Johnson? This is deep science that an average Joe will not understand. So you need, and he's supposed to take that vaccine and to bring his kids to take that vaccine. So we need to educate them. A year on, the disruptive nature of the coronavirus pandemic has become the new normal. Though there are some countries that are yet to embrace the importance of fighting on one front against this common enemy. So as long as vaccine nationalism dictates the means, COVID-19 shall be the end. We're just past half at the hour. Here's what's coming up shortly on Global Business. The European Central Bank will accelerate its bond buying program to stabilize the bloc's economies given the pandemic's economic damage. And Americans are contemplating going back to the office after a year of working from home.
taken me completely out of my depth, but at the same time, it's exciting. It's new, it's different, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are these stories that need to be told. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back to the program. These are some of the stories making your headlines at this hour. Nigeria continues to deal with a worrying wave of school kidnappings. In the latest incident early on Friday, an unknown number of students were abducted from a forestry college in Kaduna State that's located in Nigeria's northwestern frontier. The state's security commissioner says that the army was able to rescue 180 people. Most of them were students. Representatives of the government and the South Sudan Opposition Movement Alliance faction have recommitted themselves to the 2017 Secession of Hostilities Agreement. During the just-concluded round of talks in Kenya, the parties agreed to abstain from any form of violence and to duly investigate human rights violations. They've also agreed to grant unhindered, unconditional access to humanitarian assistance to all parts of South Sudan. More than 40 ambassadors of different countries based in Ethiopia have visited the Tigray regional state capital of Mekele. The diplomats expressed readiness to support Ethiopia's efforts to calm the region and deliver aid. The U.S. ambassador to Ethiopia told local media her government will support Ethiopia in efforts to manage the challenges in Tigray. And finally, Turkey says it has resumed diplomatic contacts with Egypt. Bilateral ties were particularly strained after the removal of Mohamed Morsi, Egypt's first democratically elected president and a close ally of Ankara. Both countries have been at opposing sides on a whole range of issues from the Libyan conflict to how to use and share resources in the Mediterranean. That's a run through your headlines. The European Central Bank says it will significantly ramp up the pace of its pandemic emergency bond purchase program in a bid to soothe jitters about a rise in government borrowing costs. ECB Chief Christine Lagarde said the move over the coming months is aimed at preventing an undesirable early end to cheap credit when the Eurozone economy still needs ample support to recover from the damage inflicted by the pandemic. Lagarde said even though risks to the 19-nation currency club have become a bit more balanced, ongoing pandemic-related shutdowns were still weighing on economic activity, at least in the short term. Uncertainty also does remain over the speed of vaccinations and threats posed by various variants. Global markets have been roiled recently by a rapid rise in bond deals that's triggered by signs or at least expectations of high inflation on the horizon. The Governing Council decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to a level sufficiently close to but below 2% within our projection horizon, and such convergence has been consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. These projections foresee annual real GDP growth at 4% in 21, 4.1% in 22, and 2.1% in 23. There is, no, um, there is no reference to a particular day. Uh, there is no reference to uh, any kind of yield curve control if it is the question that you are angling. 
too. We're not doing yield curve control. We are preserving favorable financing condition. Now, it's been about a year since much of the United States went into lockdown in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. But vaccines are providing a measure of hope of a return to normalcy. So many Americans are contemplating going back to the office after a year of working remotely. But what exactly will that look like? CGTN's Jim Spellman tries to find out. Like many of us here in the U.S., I've spent the last year or so mostly working from home. Well, actually, in my case, in my garage here just outside Washington, D.C. But with vaccines on the horizon, we could go back to normal in a matter of months. But will normal actually feel normal? Let's find out. By last fall, about 95 percent of office employees in the D.C. region were working from home. Employers expect 30 percent of their employees to be physically at work sites by the end of March. That should increase to about 75 percent by the fall. CGTN's offices are right in the middle of downtown Washington. I've been to the office briefly a couple times, but that's about it. Time to walk around these familiar streets, streets that are now mostly empty. The Greater Washington Partnership is an alliance of businesses in the region. They put together a study looking at how the city may change when people come back to work. Francesca Ayafreda is vice president of inclusive growth at the Greater Washington Partnership. What will the city look like when this starts to fade and people come back to work? So I think you'll start to see hybrid working models where people are working in the office maybe a couple days a week. DC region is second only to San Francisco in number of remote capable jobs. Those remote capable jobs are disproportionately held by high skilled workers and they tend to be disproportionately white. We see groups of individuals being hit particularly hard by a sustained shift to remote work. Those are frontline workers, small businesses and the black and Latinx workforce in particular. Many of the restaurants that cater to office workers have been hit hard. But I find one of my favorite places still open, Yaffa, a falafel spot. Nader Hashem is the owner. How's it going? I'm going to get a falafel sandwich. Yes, sir. How's business been? Uh, really bad. Really disappointed. That bad. Yeah. How, mu how much are you down? We are almost 90% from three to 400 customers a day to 20 to 25 customers. Wow. Yeah. I mean, wow. what can you do? Just keep it going and see what happens next. I think, future-wise, you're going to cut down less space, work from home instead of the city. What's that going to mean to you? That's going to hurt us. That's, we're going to go, we're going to get hurt really bad. Employers are worried about losing their organizational culture. They're worried about employee mental health and reduced productivity from working remotely. So I'm texting CGTN anchor Mike Walter to see if he can come say hi. Some of the impact is hard to measure. Yeah. There he is, Mike it's, Walter. It's been a while. How are you? I know. But people working from home and the few coming into the office are all feeling it. So you're one of the few people that's been working coming to downtown just about this whole last year. What's the city been like? Well, it, it, it's been like what you see. I mean, it's just a ghost town. But, but to take it one step further, I mean, you know, like uh, the camaraderie that you have in a newsroom where I just come over and just, you know, shoot the breeze with you, it just doesn't exist anymore. Everybody's so sad. But Mike expects the city to evolve and find new ways to thrive. There's a lot of opportunity here for reinvention, for rebirth of, of, of the city, of these individual businesses, and kind of how we approach our lives. Yeah, and I think a lot of things that we took for granted, now we think a lot about, you know, uh, you know the closeness of family and loved ones, uh, just even have a conversation like this. I mean, we, you just don't have them anymore. Soon, one way or another, many of us will be back to work, facing and creating a new normal. Jim Spellman, CGTN, Washington. Right, in a story there about what many of us are certainly thinking about, how we're going to get back to work. Now, on to New Zealand. Its economy suffered from the loss of international tourist traffic and spending, but also traffic and spending from students due to this pandemic. But exporters have a reason to celebrate after January's upgrade in its free trade agreement with China, which paves the way for reduced tariffs on a wide range of commodities. From Auckland, here's Owen Poland. This little girl is about three or four days old. In less than a year, these kid goats will be old enough to join a herd that can't wait to produce milk for the Chinese market. Um, it's one of the biggest um, markets in the world, and if we can get our product over to China, then you know it's a win-win. Finity Farms has invested millions of dollars building state-of-the-art milking parlours that handle 100 goats at a time. And new barns house a growing herd that depends on increased trade with China. I think it's wonderful that 
we're both working together to create a really positive um, trading you know, uh, relationship. 100 kilometres away, the goat's milk is processed at an infant formula factory where $50 million has been spent upgrading facilities to meet Chinese requirements for food safety and quality. We've seen massive growth and this upgrade is only going to allow us to grow even more over the coming years. So it's fantastic for everyone. Despite the disruption to international markets caused by COVID-19, New Zealand's exports to China fell by less than 3% in 2020, which demonstrates the resilience of the bilateral trading relationship. What's more, business leaders believe that the upgraded free trade agreement will create new opportunities to help New Zealand recover from the pandemic. Reduced tariffs for timber products also promise more jobs in the forestry sector, which will hopefully encourage greater investment in rural areas, where work can be hard to find. Certainly any improvement to the overall trading environment does incentivise increased investment. Um, that's what we've always traditionally seen, uh, and we expect that to happen uh, this time around as well. Upgrading the free trade agreement will also speed up customs clearance for perishable exports like live lobsters and other seafood. And it helps uh, the consumers in China because overall it means that our products can get through to China um, at a lower overall net cost. And for the goats, having a reporter to nibble on is a bonus. They get fed well. And they don't mind eating clothes either, do no, they? Actually? No, they would eat anything. <laughs> Owen Poland. CGTN, Auckland. Companies in southern China say they're reaping the rewards as Beijing pushes a tech-driven innovation strategy to advance much more improved productivity. CGTN's Lu Siri has more from the Guangdong city of Foshan on what's hot. Selling products via live streaming is now routine for Aero, China's leading brand in sanitary products. The company says a strong online presence is helping to secure faster and easier deals. Last year, their online sales topped 7 million yuan during the 011 shopping carnival in November. And the company has upgraded to smart facilities that now offer customized services. Smart products require us to improve the quality and efficiency of our production infrastructure. We've introduced advanced production lines, including robotics, to complete complex procedures. For many companies in Foshan, digitalization is a core aspect for many businesses. Aside from online selling and producing smart technology, it is the state-of-the-art operations and streamlined production that are enabling the companies to react timely to the market. From 2012 to 2020, the household electronic appliance company Mydea invested more than 10 billion yuan to reconstruct itself from the inside out. The painstaking process saw radical changes brought to 10 business divisions and 20 branches worldwide. But it's finally paid off, with revenue tripling to what it was prior to the upgrade, with fewer staff. The company says they will continue their journey and help others enjoy the benefits of digitalization. We believe that a successful company in the future should be driven by software because it helps to improve the user experience. We'll continue to strengthen our ability to innovate and become a user-oriented world-leading technology group. The manufacturing industry in our city has a long history. So there is a lot of room for industrial digitization to be carried out. In this regard, we will introduce a three-year action plan for further development. We will also increase investment to support local enterprises. The official says the majority of manufacturing companies in Foshan have already digitalized, paving the way towards a more efficient future. Lu Sirei, CGTN, Foshan. Quick run through commodity prices. Let's start with copper. They're back above $9,100 a tonne in London, going as high as $9,135. In today's session, our Brent crude prices hovering close to $70 a barrel, but haven't really gone through that marker just yet. $69.90 is a peak so far. Despite the rise that we've seen now in crude prices, Nigeria State and Oil Firm says the consumer should not expect any price hikes this month. And that just adds to the mix of contradictory signals we're getting from the country's policymakers. The Petroleum Product Pricing Regulatory Authority, the Triple PRA, put out an announcement yesterday that puts the retail price of a litre of petrol at around 50 US cents, effectively raising the retail price. But NNPC clearly has a different story. Here's what's coming up next.
We'll take a look at a Kenya-based platform that's taking on Spotify and Apple Music. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climates and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Adnan Shirishi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. You don't find the stories of North Africa by sitting on the sidelines. No one else will take you where we can in North Africa. And no one else will show you what it's all about. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back. Now, despite the rise of streaming as a primary mode of music consumption around the world, illegal music download sites are still a major source of music for quite a few users across the continent. Now, the local, the impact rather for local African artists has been missing out on major potential earnings from music sales and royalties. On Grassroots Tonight, CGTN's Daniel Arapmoy takes up the story of one startup that's not just championing local talent, it's also leading the fight against piracy. When Danish national Martin Nielsen moved to Kenya in 2012 to work with a venture capital firm, he soon noticed an obvious trend. Most locals consumed music by downloading tracks illegally. Having seen the evolution Sweden Spotify from Scandinavia into a global giant, Nielsen set out to create an alternative to illegal music downloads for African users and artists. Most African consumers are really interested and intrigued and really want to listen to, to content from the continent. But um, because of the limitations of most of the consumers' devices, they are limited from many streaming services. Um, they might not have the, the, the data that is needed for streaming. They might not have the storage on their devices. And so for that reason, we allow a download service so that we can give uh, users the, and customers the, the music that, that they are craving. Fast forward eight years, the Kenya-based company he co-founded and now leads Mudundo is listed on the Danish stock market and is posting rapid growth in users. Last year, Mudundo listed on the Nasdaq First North, which is a stock exchange um, based in Copenhagen. It is a growth stock exchange, so it's focusing on growth companies and not big sort of main market with established sort of businesses. Um, we listed, um, we listed in September last year, um, and we had an oversubscription of 111%. Uh, that basically means that, yeah, 111% uh, more shares were bought than what we were offering. Mudundo is free to users and makes money through advertising. With its over 20 million monthly downloads and streams, artists have flocked to the site to take advantage of the growing audiences and a piece of the growing revenue pie. The biggest challenge for artists is usually uh, reaching out actually to your audience, to your target audience. Yeah, marketing is always the biggest issue. Kenyan musician Viri is one of the 90,000 African music artists who have signed up. Thanks to streaming sites like Mdundo, we have a way to commercialize our music. You know, that's, that applies to the beginners and also us as recognized artists just to get to know how your music is doing out there and the numbers and now how it, uh, it reflects financially. Yeah, because in such tough times, we can only depend on streaming because we don't have events at the moment. And if they are there, they are very little. 
So they're not very sustainable. Mudundo's users jumped 40% to 7 million in the six months to December 2020. According to the company's half-year report, it's now targeting 9 million monthly active users by June 2021 and 18 million by June 2022. To hit that goal, the company is focusing on Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Ghana and Nigeria. Daniel Arabmoy, CGTN. Now one rather obvious side effect of the pandemic lockdowns we're seeing around the world has been that a lot of us are walking around with a lot more hair. Salons and barbershops around the world are mostly closed. But one group of Venezuelan entrepreneurs say this pandemic should not mean that we have a moratorium on haircuts. And they're devising a way to make it so. CGTN's Mary Trinimena reports from Caracas. They claim to be the first mobile barbershop in Venezuela. Their mission to make sure people look and feel their best. Even when lockdown orders make it difficult for people to get a haircut using public transportation. Prime Barber Truck travels to a different neighborhood each day, offering haircuts, beard trims, and facials. It also offers private at-home service with a barber knocking on the client's front door. Our idea was to create a normal barbershop, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic, everything was closed, and we found ourselves saying, how can we reach people? The company advertises the location of its trucks on social media each day, and since it started in October, Prime Barber Trucks has developed a loyal following. Today they are here, and tomorrow they could be at another place. And also, you can see the art of the barbers in action while they work with customers when you pass by on the street. Even during the coronavirus pandemic, with most people spending less time in public, a good haircut has its value. We Venezuelan men always want to look our best, and I work for a company where you need to have a good image. The standard price for a haircut inside a mobile barber shop is around 10 US dollars. That's comparable to the price at many traditional barber shops across the country. Park. In shopping malls and alongside food trucks, the owners of Prime Barber Trucks say they have found a winning business plan they hope will attract customers even after pandemic restrictions ease up. Maritrini Mena, CGTN, Caracas. Let's wrap up the hour with the run through the currencies. Ghana SEDI is our focus. It was around 573.25 against the dollar this evening. As a West African oil, gold and cocoa producer was releasing its budget for the 2021 fiscal year. Now, to be clear, the SEDI has been posting some consistent gains against the dollar so far this year. It's clawed back around 2% of its value. It settled around a 5.7 or so level against the greenback in a year in which a country is looking to borrow some $5 billion from international debt markets. Those are your currencies, and that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen on the program in the last hour. There are many ways to get your thoughts back to us, all of them on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.